The Gospel according to Mark. It's one of the first accounts of the life of Jesus, and our earliest historical traditions link this book to a Christian scribe named Mark, or John Mark. He was a co-worker with Paul and a close partner with Peter. And in fact, an ancient church historian named Papias, he recalls that Mark had collected all of the eyewitness accounts and memories of Peter and then shaped them into this account. But Mark didn't just randomly throw the pieces together. He's carefully designed the story of Jesus. In the first line of the book, Mark makes this claim about Jesus. It's the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now what's interesting is that this is the only time Mark is going to tell you what he thinks. For the rest of the book, he's going to influence you by simply putting Jesus' actions and words in front of you and showing you how other people react to him. Now Mark's designed the story of Jesus as a drama with three acts. The first one set in Galilee, the third one is set in Jerusalem, and the second act shows Jesus on the way from one place to the other. And each of the acts focuses on repeated theme. So in Act 1, everybody's blown away by Jesus and they're wondering, who is this Jesus? In Act 2, it's the disciples who are struggling to understand what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. And then in Act 3, we watch the surprising paradox of how Jesus becomes the Messianic King. Let's just dive in and you'll see how it unfolds. After the opening line, Mark begins with a quotation from the ancient prophets Isaiah and Malachi, who said that God would send a messenger to Israel to prepare them for when God would show up himself to rescue his people and become their king. And Mark introduces John, the Baptist, as that messenger, and then right when you expect God to show up personally, Mark introduces Jesus. And as he comes onto the scene, the heavens open, God's spirit descends on Jesus, and God says, you are my beloved son. After this, Mark places in front of us a summary of Jesus' core message. He went about Galilee announcing the good news that God's kingdom has come near. Jesus is carrying forward the story from the Old Testament scriptures about God's rescue operation for his world. Through Jesus, God is restoring his reign over the world by confronting and defeating evil and its hold on people's lives, and then by inviting them to live under his reign by following Jesus. From here, Mark's given us a big block of stories showing us Jesus' power as he brings God's kingdom. He goes about healing people whose bodies are sick or broken or under the oppression of dark spiritual powers. And Jesus even does something that for Jewish people, only God has the right to do. He forgives people's sins. And Jesus' actions here produce lots of different responses. So some people follow him and become his disciples. Other people don't know what to think, and still others reject him completely, especially Israel's leaders who accuse him of blaspheming God and being empowered by evil. But Jesus isn't surprised by these responses. In fact, he draws attention to it. In chapter 4, Mark has collected many of Jesus' parables about the hidden, mysterious nature of God's kingdom. And Jesus says that his message is like seed falling on different types of soil. Some are receptive, some are not. Or it's like a mustard seed that's very tiny, it seems insignificant, but then it grows huge and surprises everyone. Jesus' point is that he really is the Messiah, bringing God's kingdom, but it doesn't look like what anybody expected. And this growing confusion about Jesus among the crowds is connected to a key idea Mark emphasizes at the end of Act 1, that even among Jesus' disciples there's confusion. Even they are struggling to grasp who Jesus really is, and that brings us to Act 2. It begins with a crucial conversation. Jesus takes the disciples aside and he asks, who do you all say that I am? And Peter speaks up saying, you're the Messiah. But it becomes clear that for Peter this means that Jesus is a victorious military king from the line of David who will rescue Israel from the Romans. But for Jesus to be the Messiah means that he's the suffering servant king of Isaiah 53 who will bring God's rule by giving up his life in Jerusalem. And the disciples, they don't get it. They think following King Jesus is going to mean fame and status and importance, and Jesus makes it clear that following him is actually like dying, like carrying your own cross. It means rejecting violence and pride and selfishness and giving one's life out for others in acts of service and love. He has the same conversation with them two more times, and it all culminates in Jesus' important statement that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to become a servant and give his life as a ransom for many. The disciples still don't get it. They respond in confusion and fear. And so here in Act 2, Mark has placed another key story that echoes the book's introduction. 
Jesus takes three of his disciples up to a mountain, and he's suddenly transformed. He's radiating with light and glory, and a cloud envelops them. Now, this is just like the glory of the God of Israel that showed up long ago on Mount Sinai. And then the two prophets who stood in God's presence on Mount Sinai, Moses and Elijah, they appear next to Jesus as God announces again, this is my beloved son. Now, by placing this story in the middle of all these conversations in Act 2, Mark is making an astounding claim that Jesus, God's Son, is the physical embodiment of God's own glory. And in Jesus, the glorious God of Israel is going to become king by suffering and dying for the sins of his own people. It's a puzzling claim that confuses and scares the disciples as they leave the mountain. Which brings us to Act 3. Jesus makes a very public royal entry into Jerusalem for Passover. People are hailing him as the Messiah. Then he enters into the temple courtyard and he asserts his royal authority by running out the thieves and crooks and stopping the sacrificial system. Then this kicks off a whole week of Jesus debating and confronting the leaders of Israel, condemning their hypocrisy, and so they set in motion a plan to have him killed. And Jesus warns his disciples, predicting that Jerusalem and its temple will be destroyed within a generation, and his disciples will be persecuted just like him, until he returns one day to bring God's kingdom fully over the world. And it all leads up to the final night. Jesus has his last Passover meal with the disciples, a symbolic meal that told the story of Israel's liberation from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. And Jesus takes these symbols and he gives them new meaning. They point to the liberation from sin and death that will happen through the death of the suffering servant Messiah. From here, the story rushes forward to Jesus' arrest, his trial before Israel's priests and the Roman governor Pilate, all resulting in Jesus' crucifixion. And it culminates in a key scene that matches the important scenes from Acts 1 and 2. Except this time, it's darkness that descends, not a cloud. And instead of the divine voice from heaven, it's Jesus' voice crying out before he dies. And then most surprising is that it's a Roman soldier who sees Jesus die, who grasps and then announces who Jesus is. This man was the Son of God. He's the first person in the story to recognize the story's shocking claim about Jesus' identity, that it's the crucified Son of God who's the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, who died for his friends and for his enemies. After this, Jesus' body is placed in a tomb, and on the first day of the new week, two women from his disciples come to the tomb, and they discover that the tomb is empty, the stones rolled away, and an angelic man informs them that Jesus isn't here, that he's risen from the dead. And so he orders them to go and tell this good news to the other disciples that Jesus is alive, that he'll meet them back up in Galilee. And the women, they're freaked out. Mark says that they fled from the tomb in terror, telling no one, for they were afraid. And that's how the book ends, with Jesus' disciples showing the same kind of fear and confusion that concluded Acts 2 and 1. Now, if you look in your Bible, you'll see that the Gospel of Mark has more to its ending, where Jesus appears, he speaks to his disciples, but there's also a note there telling you that that ending is not part of the original book, that it's only found in later, less reliable manuscripts. Now, it's possible that the original ending got lost or that Mark actually never finished writing his account, but it's more likely that this abrupt ending is intentional to make a point. The entire story has focused on the shocking claim that puzzled Jesus' disciples from beginning to end, that it's the suffering, crucified, and risen Jesus who's the Messiah, the Son of God, that God's love and upside-down kingdom were revealed as Jesus died for the sins of the world. And so this story ends without closure, and it forces you, the reader, to grapple with this very strange and scandalous claim about Jesus. And are you going to run away like the disciples? Or are you going to recognize Jesus as your king and go and tell the good news? And only you can answer that question. And that's what the Gospel of Mark is all about. All right, another excellent summary. I cannot encourage you enough to take advantage of those videos that are out there. When I stumbled across them, it was not too long, maybe weeks or months before we began this study, I was thrilled uh, to find them. I was not familiar with these fellows before that. All right, the Gospel of Mark. 
uh, survey. Just uh, if you're looking to, to put the timeline for it, it covers uh, the time between 29 A.D. 33 A.D. You'll see as we get into this that that Mark. Remember when we taught through this here a, a few years back? I don't remember how many years ago it was now that we taught it as, as a gospel in a hurry. Now, that wasn't a theme we gave it, but I pointed out to you that over and over, Mark uses this language of next, then, immediately, straightway. It's a, he's, the, the picture you get is that Mark is, is hastening as quickly as he can to the cross. And so, so he picks up. He, we have no birth narrative here. Uh, this picks up as Jesus comes on the scene. Uh, Places that this takes place is Galilee and Perea, uh, then Judea and Jerusalem. You can divide uh, the gospel into two major sections. The, the focus that Jesus came to serve in this section in, in chapter 1 through chapter 10 is about sayings of Jesus and signs uh, that he, miracles he performs. He does this in Galilee and, and Perea. Uh, he's presented the presentation of the servant. Uh, there is then pretty quickly opposition to the servant. And then there's the instruction, the teaching by the servant, the parables that was referenced in the video. And then this, the second half of the book, which, which takes in really the last few weeks uh, of Jesus' ministry, Jesus came to sacrifice. So he came to serve. We read that in Mark 10, 45. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And he begins to talk about how he's going to Jerusalem. He'll be rejected, murdered. And so he teaches that he came to sacrifice. The, the focus is on suffering. Judea, the scope is narrowing for Mark. And then Jerusalem, specifically the holy city. There's the rejection of the servant. <clears throat> and then after that, the resurrection of the servant. Now, we'll say this a little more. We get to the end when I taught through Mark. I taught Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. I'm familiar with the textual uh, discussion, the questions. Uh, I had a professor in seminary who said, when we get to Mark chapter 16, verse 9, we're in the twilight, twilight of apocryphal literature. Um, my approach to the scripture is that God sovereignly preserves his word. And since it is a, a citation that stood for years, verses 9 to 20, and there's material in there that is... That, that it fits in the comport of the gospel, I taught it. Uh, if I'm going to stand before the Lord one day and give account, and I will, teachers are held to a stricter judgment, and I don't want to argue the case as to why I left out a portion of God's word. I would rather argue the case and have the Lord rebuke me and chasten me and I, that, I, that I taught everything that I thought pertained to God's word. So that's how we treated the 16th chapter. Well, let's look at a, at a, a survey, a little more of a survey. It's the shortest and simplest of the four Gospels. It has a tone to it that is crisp and fast-moving, focused on the life of Jesus Christ. Mark doesn't give us much editorial comment, except as was cited in the video where he introduces the book in chapter 1, verse 1. Just remind you of that, what he says there. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news. Remember, gospel is the, is the Greek for, for you, angelos. Uh, you break it up. You hear in that you, the E-U, is good. Angelos, we hear our word angel in that. Angel is a messenger. It is the good message of Jesus Christ, concerning Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the subject, the Son of God. So the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he asserts the deity of Jesus at the very outset. I want to cite something, too, real quickly while we're in this section. If you keep reading in chapter 1, verse 2, I told you this when we went through the gospel, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and in the very next words, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. That is Malachi 3.1. Liberals love this. What they're not honest about, however, is that the very next verse is, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. That is from Isaiah. It was not unusual to introduce a prophetic citation by citing another prophetic 
uh, statement which would correspond with this. Malachi, if you remember we went through the Old Testament, Malachi was in the section we called what? The minor prophets. Where was Isaiah? The major prophets. Mark is quoting a major prophet and he introduces it with a quotation from a minor prophet. So if you ever hear some, one of these educated fools tell you, well clearly Mark didn't know what he was talking about. He says, there was Isaiah and he quotes Malachi. All you need to do is smile at him and say, yes he does. Keep reading. He quotes, Mal he quotes Isaiah. He was introducing Isaiah using Malachi. So uh, this, uh, the narrative speaks for itself. It tells the story of the servant who constantly ministers to others through preaching, healing, teaching, ultimately his own death. Mark gives a pretty graphic uh, description of the steady building of hostility and opposition to Jesus as he resolutely moves toward the fulfillment of his earthly mission. You'll remember in Matthew, when we looked at that, if you were paying attention, that, that there was a season you could call a season of peace, a season of welcome. Mark doesn't deal with that. Mark wants us to see that the servant is a suffering servant. And he faces opposition very soon in his, in his ministry. Remember, these, these gospel writers are not giving us blow-by-blow blow chronology. That's not their purpose. And we'll see what the purpose of Mark is here in a little bit. Almost 40% of the gospel is devoted to a detailed account of the last eight days of Jesus' life climaxing in the resurrection. Think about that. Almost half of it focused in on the last eight days. So that's why you say, when you, when you read these language of, of Mark, uh, immediately, next, then, he's getting Jesus to the cross as quickly as he can to talk about that, that good news of the cross. As I said, he's, he's per portrayed in the book, chapter 1, verse 10, as the one who serves, 11 through 16, the one who sacrifices. The first four chapters uh, emphasize the words of the servant. Chapters 5 to 7 uh, put an e emphasis on his works. That is not to say that in reading chapters 1 to 4 you won't come across his works, nor that you won't have his words in 5 to 7. We're talking about emphasis, what dominates those sections. As the, as the book moves on, you see Jesus focusing more and more on his teaching with his disciples. I'll back away a minute. When we were studying uh, years ago uh, what we called uh, the, the commandment hiding in plain sight, the language of Jesus after the resurrection it bound up in the commissioning passages, as you go disciple the nations, that's the, that's the command. Make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. There's the commandment in plain sight. It's there. When we talked about that, we said that when Jesus prays in John 17, I have finished the work you've given me to do. And he prays that still alive. And we know he's still got to go to the cross. That, that he was referencing in that, that he had he had prepared the disciples at a level where he could leave and the Holy Spirit would come and take the teaching he had given them and they were now ready to become disciple makers. Remember that? We talked about that then. So, so he, he intensifies his teaching of the disciples. He begins to prepare them for his departure. When Jesus talks about his hour being near in Mark's gospel, it is about six months away. Mark 8.31 is pivotal because uh, he speaks clearly to them. Look at Mark 8.31 with me. And he began to teach them. So this comes up again and again. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, the religious leaders, this, this blew their minds. Their understanding of Messiah was that he would come in, he would win the day, he would rally around him, a, a unified effort on the part of all the religious leaders, and they would crush the Roman army. 
be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. In chapters 11 to 16 where he, where he now focuses on, on preparation to, to be the sacrifice, the, the Passover, in Jesus you see the high priest who conducts the execution of the Passover lamb and you see in Jesus the Passover lamb. And so he's preparing them uh, for that eventuality. It cranks down to the last seven days in Jerusalem. As the hostility from the religious leaders, the, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees. We told you before, the Pharisees and the Sadducees only ever got together over one thing. The death of Jesus. And he took them on, test after test, refuting them, exposing them, embarrassing them, and it only intensified their desire to kill him. After that last supper with his disciples, he doesn't offer any resistance to his arrest, abuse, crucifixion. He epitomizes in the midst of all of that, when you study that, here is the suffering servant. Here is the servant willing to be sacrificed. It brings the two themes together. Well, as far as the introduction and title of Mark's gospel, uh, the message uh, is captured. We told you this already in Mark 10, 45. We'll just show it to you again. Uh, he's, he's introduced as the, as the Jesus is the servant on the move. Uh, he's going to do the will of the Father. He is... He's got his face set toward Jerusalem not to be deterred. Even as he's approaching death, he's ministering to others. When you look in the, in the Greek New Testament, I know you're going to run home and do this tonight, but I'm just going to tell you, look in the Greek New Testament. What you see is this, this language, kata, markon. Kata means, means according to or it's a preposition that can put the downward force on things. But this is the story according to Mark. To, according to, to, to Mark. His Latin name, because it's going to see in a minute this was a Roman audience he's writing to, was Marcus. But his Hebrew name was John. Look at Acts 12.12. 12. What, what do we end up calling him? His Roman name was Marcus. His Hebrew name was John. What do we call him? John Mark. He's John Mark. Look at Acts 12, 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, this is Mark, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Then chapter 12, verse 25. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And then Acts 15, 37. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. Well, who is this, this author? We cited Acts 12, 12 for you. Uh, when Peter was, in, think about this, when he was in the, uh, in the garden, uh, Peter must have traveled to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, because in the garden... Uh, this servant girl recognizes his voice at the gate. Chapter 12, verse 30, 13 to 16, when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice. In her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran. Remember what had happened? Peter was in prison. What were they doing inside? Praying for God to release Peter from prison. So in the middle of the prayer meeting, the servant girl Rhoda runs to the door, opens it, recognizes Peter's voice, doesn't let him in in her excitement and joy, runs back uh, and reported that Peter was standing at the gate, which I'm fairly sure, interrupting prayer meeting, someone probably asked, why didn't you let him in? Okay, so they had to go back and do that. They said to her, you're out of your mind. She kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, 
It's his angel. It, there, there's, a, there's another lesson here. We need to ask in faith, not doubting. I mean, these people were praying earnestly for God to move. They'd seen God move mightily. Now a report comes that this fellow that you were praying would be released from prison. He's outside. You're crazy. Let's pray. But we're like that, aren't we? We're like that. I mean, we, we need to guard our hearts. Asking God for things. In the middle of them, the answer comes. That's nonsense. Let's pray. No, that's what was happening in, in the early church. We, we have good friends, don't we, in the early church, at least, when we struggle that way. But Peter continued knocking. When they opened, they saw him and were amazed. We also learn about this author, Mark, that he was, he was uh, Barnabas's cousin. Look at Colossians 4.10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction, if he comes to, to you, welcome him. So we're, there we have the citation. Now, Peter may have been the person who led this young man to the Lord. Look at 1 Peter 5, 13. She who is in Babylon, probably Rome, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. They were not, they were not uh, biologically related. But you find, you find Paul doing this, speaking of Timothy, my son, and Titus, my son. It's language that may give us a hint that, that Peter may have been the one instrumental in, in Mark coming uh, to faith in Christ. Mark's close association with Peter is what gave teeth to this apostolic account. As was mentioned in the, uh, in the video, it is generally thought that what Mark gives us is Peter's memoirs. And some scholars, beyond my pay grade, say that if you study the language of First and Second Peter, study the language of Mark, there are some fascinating similarities to the word usage, the word order. It's been suggested that Mark was referring to himself in his account of a, of a certain young man in, in Gethsemane. Look at Mark 15, 14, verses 51 to 52. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. And he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. That gives you a picture of sort of the trauma going on around the death and then moving toward the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, in Mark 14, 50, uh, we're told that they all left him and fled. So Mark may be giving us a first-hand account of what happened there. Uh, Mark was taken along on some missionary journeys, you remember, in Acts chapter 12, verse 25. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Acts 13, uh, 5, they left uh, on the first missionary journey. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. They had John, that is John Mark, there to assist them. You also know the sad part of the story that, that Mark left early. In Acts 13, 13, and returned to Jerusalem. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. This caused no, no small stir. And in God's providence, this unhappy occurrence led to the doubling of the missionary uh, engagement. We're told that when Barnabas wanted to bring Mark on the second journey, missionary journey, Paul, Paul said no. And so uh, Paul, I mean, Mark and, and Barnabas went together and Paul and Silas went. Look at Acts 15, 36 to 41. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. So they're making the rounds back. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take him. Take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Therefore, there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers 
to the grace of the Lord. They would have had to commend another partner, Silas. And they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. But that's not the whole story. If you know the New Testament, Paul writes in Colossians 4, verse 10. We just read it a while ago. In Philemon 24, in Colossians 4, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, Paul's in prison, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, also. And so he's back with him. A reconciliation has occurred, which, by the way, is how the gospel works. When reconciliation cannot be effected between two people, it is a functional, practical denial of the gospel. And then, of course, Philemon 24. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. You know, Demas abandons later on. So, so they, were, they were reunited. And then the most encouraging thing, uh, perhaps, is toward the end of Paul's life. 2 Timothy 4, 11, about 12 years later, if you're looking for the chronology there. Mark says, Luke alone, Luke alone is with me. This, you read some things, by the way, and you think, gosh, that's so sad. I mean, look at what the impact Mark, I mean, Paul had made. And he's coming toward the end of his life, and his physician, Luke, is the only one with him. He says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. So that's the, that's the good ending there. There's pretty much a universal attestation by the early church that, that Mark is the author of this gospel with the caveat that he's, he's writing Peter's take on the gospel. If, you want, if you're interested in church fathers, Papias, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, all affirmed the authorship of Mark. Well, what about the date for it? We talked leading into this about the about the uh, the synoptic problem, or the synoptic challenge. Really, synoptic simply is from the uh, S Y N sin together, and optic seen together. How do you see the gospel accounts and and scholarship again? that I yield to, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are seen as a synoptic gospels. John's gospel stands separate as more theologically interpretive. So when you, when you grant that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels, who came first? And that's a big debate, and, and, and much has been written on that through the years. But there's a general consensus that Mark was the first of the four Gospels. Hard to pin down the date. Look at Mark 13, 2. Toward the end of Jesus' life, he's in Jerusalem, and he says, do you see these great stone buildings? This is the, the temple. Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. What does that tell us? If you know New Testament history, what have we just been told there? That Jerusalem has not been destroyed. When was it destroyed? 70 A.D. So we know, if we grant that, that the writing in Mark is authentic, authentic, I mean, then it had to be written before 70 A.D. As to when, it's difficult. Peter r reportedly was martyred in 64 A.D., And so you would put the dating of Mark between 55 A.D. and sometime before that, which would make it the earliest gospel account. Mark is writing to a, a, a Roman readership. In fact, tradition suggests that it, this was written in Rome. And some say that this explains why things like the genealogy of, of Christ, fulfilled prophecy, references to the law, certain Jewish customs that you might find in Matthew are not in Mark. They would have had little meaning to a, to a Gentile, a Roman audience. Another interesting thing, we won't, we won't put this on the screen or go into it a lot, but, but, but Mark 
interpreted Aramaic words. Mark 3.17, James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges. Boanerges is an, is an Aramaic term, so Mark uses that, but he interprets it. That is, sons of thunder. When you had the healing of, of the little girl in Mark 5.41, taking her by the hand, Jesus said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. That's Aramaic. And so Mark doesn't just let it stand. He's considerate of his audience. The predominantly Jewish audience would have understood that. And so he interprets it for them. Mark 7, 34, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphtha, that is, be open. And so he, he's telling the story, and he's translating the Aramaic words that Jesus used. Mark 15, 22, they brought him to the place called Golgotha, Aramaic for the skull, which means the skull. And then I won't bog down with this, but he uses a number of Latin terms. You have to be looking at the language to understand, in the place of their Greek equivalents, and there are several places in Mark's gospel. So what this tells us is he's writing, we believe, from Rome, to a Roman audience, a Gentile, a non-Jewish audience. You know what the official language of Rome, we talked about this when we went through our Old Testament and inter intertestamental period, Latin. Latin died out. Even the Romans adopted Greek because Greek had been universally spread by Alexander the Great. But the Romans read and spoke Latin and so so Mark is, is keyed into this, to this Roman audience, uh, probably written from Rome. What about the theme of, of Mark? Well, the first verse tells us that, that this is the good news concerning or about with its focus on Jesus Christ, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is the story about the Son of God. Son of God would have been a term variously received. Uh, the Jews despised that. It was blasphemy. It's one of the charges they level against Jesus. He called God his Father. In a non-Jewish setting, in a Roman context, Son of God to them would have meant someone divine. Deity. And so it's the story of the Son of God who's come. And remember Jesus, what was Jesus' favorite designation of himself? Son of man. And so the assertion that he's the Son of God and the Son of God calls himself Son of Man weds together for us his deity and his humanity, uh, as the old uh, writers talked about, inextricably joined together, two natures, one person. So Mark 10.45 becomes, though, the, uh, uh, the theme for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, or the definite article there, for the many. It's the story of the Son of God, the suffering servant, come to earth. Look at Philippians 2, 5 to 11. You pick up in Paul's writing this, this same heartbeat. It's called the kenosis passage because of the word kenosis meaning the emptying. Jesus empties himself of divine prerogative coming to earth. So Paul says to the church at Philippi, a church he loved greatly, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, we talked this morning about the new birth, the implication of the new birth. When, the, when you're saved, you don't become a first-ranked theologian. But when you're saved, there is a, you've been made a partaker of the divine nature, Peter says. You, you, have, you have new life in you. You're... Uh, your want to has been fixed. Not perfectly fixed, but it's been fixed. 
Your mind that was darkened has been, is now being enlightened. Your heart that was set against the things of God is now a heart that is, is in love with God. Your chooser, your will, is choosing differently in the new birth. So that this mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. There's a lot said there. Paul asserts the equality of Jesus and God. Co-equality. He is asserting an implication of the Trinity. But he emptied himself. There's that word kenosis. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Don't be thrown by this form of God, likeness of men. This language that is saying Though being very God and becoming a man and being found in human form. So it wasn't a likeness, as we would think of likeness, sort of like he was like. That's what the Gnostics taught. No, no. Being found in human form. He humbled himself. Notice this servant motif. By becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. The shameful, painful death of the cross. The cross where the Old Testament said, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. Paul says that's the mindset that the people of God, the followers of Christ, must cultivate. Therefore, in the light of this humbling, therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. See, he has the highest name in heaven and earth. So that the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's not a question. We've said this to you before. It's not a question to any son of Adam, any daughter of Eve, the hardest heart you know, the coldest person you know, the cruelest person you know. It's not a question, will you bow? The question is, when will you bow? Will you bow now to your salvation? Or will you bow before him then to your damnation? Every knee will bow. Will you confess him now to, to the glorious experience of, of saving faith, being brought into the family of God? Or will you confess him then and be thrown into the darkest place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth for all of eternity? So, uh, Mark is not a biography it's a topical narrative if you want to know what kind of literature it is it lays Jesus teaching aside his works to show how they authenticate him miracles are predominant in Mark in the brief 16 chapters, 18 miracles are recorded. And they demonstrate not only Jesus' power, but his compassion. A great thing to be wed. Unheard of in that world. If you had power, you were seldom compassionate. He is showing his Gentile readers how the Son of God was rejected by his own people, achieving ultimate victory through what appeared to be defeat there is for sure someone observed I thought this, there's no doubt an evangelistic purpose behind this gospel as Mark is directing his words to a non-Jewish audience who would have had little background in Old Testament history or theology And then some have suggested that it was probably a document used to instruct and encourage Roman believers. Well, what are the keys to Mark? We talk about well, the key word or term is, is is Jesus the servant. We've already established that. The key passages we've already read several times. Won't read them again. Just cite them for you. Mark ten forty three to forty five. Mark eight thirty four to thirty seven. Uh, the first is his declaration that he is the servant. The second is if you want. Uh, to come after him 
Servants, servants don't get to put their needs first, do they? Servants don't get to make their preferences the agenda. Come after me, deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. So we looked at that already. Key chapter is chapter 8. It shows a change, a shift in Jesus' ministry emphases. Remember in Matthew, we said it was in chapter 12. The turning point in Mark 8 is the confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus begins to teach them that he will suffer. So they've identified him. They've used the right language. They've made the right identity. Jesus now has to change their definitions of what it means to be Messiah. Not ruling and reigning this time, suffering and sacrificing. Up, up until this point, by the way, in his gospel, if you read it, read it through, uh, he was validating his claims as Messiah through, as I said, his teachings and his miracles. But now he bears down and he begins to strengthen uh, the 12 for what's coming his suffering and dying at the hands of the most highly esteemed religious people in Judaism. You got to feel the tension of that. These disciples had, since they were little boys, been taught to honor and revere whatever came out of the rabbi's mouth. He spoke the oracles of God. And now they're hearing their rabbi say to them, those fellows will kill me. And as he's teaching them, he draws nearer and nearer to Jerusalem when you notice the, the timeline of Mark's gospel. And he will become the perfect servant and he will demonstrate the full extent of what servanthood looks like. And he, he commends that to us. So now... Obviously, the Gospel of Mark is about Jesus. He says so in chapter 1, verse 1. What do, we, what do we see? What do we learn? Well, we learn that the eternal Son of God, who will be declared the King of kings and Lord of lords at the end of the age, is presented as an active, compassionate, obedient servant, constantly ministering to the physical and spiritual needs of others. I told you earlier there are words you look for to hear the, hear the pace of Mark. It's a word in, in the Greek, euthus, and it's translated variously immediately, straightway. It appears 42 times in this gospel. You, have, you hear in that the nudging, the nudging, the nudging. And more, more often than in the rest of of the New Testament. If you, have a, if you have the capacity to look for Greek words in, a, in one of these search engines, euthus shows up more times in the Gospel of Mark than it does in all the rest of the New Testament. Constantly moving toward a goal that hardly anyone sees. So let's just look at some, some flavoring in Mark. Let's go with me here on how, what we hear that helps us see Jesus. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, read it to you before, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark 1.11, a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Mark is chronicling this, the Roman readership is reading this, that God from heaven spoke and declared Jesus to be the Son. A Son in whom he delights, with whom he He's well pleased. Mark 3.11, whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. What, so what do we hear? 1.1, one, one, Son of God. 1.11, you're my son. 3.11, demons, Son of God. Mark 5.7, 
Crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus? Another demon, son of the Most High God. This is, this is the gathering demoniac. I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Mark 9, 7, a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came from the, out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Mark 13, 32, but concerning that day or that hour, Jesus' teaching, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Here Jesus is calling God his Father. Mark 14, 61, he remained silent, made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? The idea of the Son of the Blessed is the Son of God. Remember the, the Orthodox Jews were very careful in how they might use the name of God. So they had these terms they would substitute. Mark 15, 39, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. This, and they pointed out in the video, and it is interesting, if you're writing to a Roman audience, who's the first person outside the inner circle to see that Jesus is the son of God? A Roman centurion. So Mark tells us about this. Well, how does it, how, what's its contribution to the Bible? 66 books in the Bible. Well, Mark is fairly clear and straightforward and easy to read. I don't want this to sound wrong, but if you're honest, some of you get bogged down in the begats. The begats are genealogies. No begats in Mark. Pew, out of the chute, he's headed to the cross. It's written in a style that would not, that, that would remove hindrances from people. He portrays Jesus, and, and this, this is a theme you'll pick up in the Old Testament, particularly Isaiah. Uh, the, some have called it the Gospel of Isaiah, about Jesus as a suffering servant. It moves quickly. You see Jesus encountering people in his work, both friends and foes. There's only two sections in the entire gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 to 34, and chapter 13, verses 3 to 37, that are an extended teaching time. And when you, when you put all these things together, you, you, you start going, Whew. Mark is really moving us to the cross. His emphasis is on actions more than words. A great study for uh, this generation to deal with the warning that we not be only hearers of the word, but we be doers of the word as well. It's a very practical approach, which would have suited the Roman mind. Only 18 out of, out of the 70 parables found in the Gospels are found in Mark. And some of them are short, one sentence in length. But over half of the 35 miracles are found in Mark. That's the highest proportion of the Gospels. Someone observed this. Again, I'm going to yield to the language experts. Mark's language is characterized by broken sentence structure, colloquialisms, and extra expressions that may reproduce Peter's style of speaking when we have occasion to study that. He uses a term, and I don't want to get off in the weeds on grammar, uh, though grammar is very important what's called the historic present tense 151 times to depict action in progress. Think about that. 151 times he uses a specific verb tense in the Greek to depict action in progress. Often with more detail than you have in, in, in Matthew or in Luke. Just real quick samples of this. I don't remember if I put this on the on the slides or not. They were all amazed. They feared exceedingly. They laughed him to scorn. They were offended at him. They were astonished beyond measure. You hear that 
uh, that kind of language coming together. You're getting into their responses. And also when you look at Jesus and you hear what he's saying, you pick up this, his reactions, his compassion, his anger, his grief, his sorrow, his warmth, the distress that he's under, his sympathy, and his indignation. They're all there. Mark challenges the reader to engage Jesus as the suffering servant and then go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Serve. Do. Christianity makes good talk but it's better when it's enacted, when it's engaged. And you get this clearly. Mark was pressing upon this, this Roman readership. By the way, we're not Romans, but we are Gentiles. We're not Jews. We're Gentiles. So something here for you and me. It's an easy read, 16 chapters. I want to read you as we close. The final section, verses 9 to 20, that sometimes are left out. I don't know what version you're using. The ESV, English Standard Version, I think, makes a citation. Yes, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 to 20, but then go ahead and include it, and I appreciate that. Listen to the language, and then we'll close with this. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. So you have this again. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them, as they were walking into the country, probably the two on the road to Emmaus. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared. Now you see, Mark's still using this language. This is what, what makes me want to believe. He's using this. He's still pushing. He's gone beyond the cross now to the post-resurrection. He appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, and here's the, here, if, if you cut out verses 9 to 20 out of Mark, it is a gospel without a commission. Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. People teach, well, doesn't that teach baptismal regeneration? Keep on reading. A text out of context is always a pretext. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. See the parallel there? Belief versus unbelief. Salvation versus condemnation. Those are the opposites there. Baptism is the sign and seal of that. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. In my name they will speak new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will be, recover. And this is the area right here, very honestly, that, that makes many people say, you back away from that. But I believe there's a very good explanation or what he is telling them about the power and authority. Is this exemplary or is it normative? I mean, should we, reading this, run out in this season of, of the year and see if we can find some snakes we can grab? That's a wrong reading of this. 
He's talking about the, the power and authority. And if, if you will allow, symbol, we by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us do have authority to withstand the serpent. But he says these signs accompany believers. Now, real quickly, I don't want to, if you ever have somebody come to you and chide you because of uh, an illness you may have, a struggle you may have, use this illness, use it in the, and, they, and they, t they tell you that in the name of Jesus, they declare you healed, and you continue to struggle with those issues and say to you, you do not have enough faith. This actually happened to a dear friend of mine, a precious lady who had the most horrible form of crippling arthritis I've ever seen in my life. The only way she could come to church worship time was on a stretcher provided by EMS. And they came and did this to her. And they began to say, confess your sin. You have sin, you're not confessing. If you confess that sin, you'll be healed. She was mortified. By the time I got to her, there's a lot of pastoral ministry to do. Read this, folks. This does not say these signs will accompany those who are on the receiving end of healing. These signs will accompany those who are believers. They will lay their hands on the sick and they, the sick, will recover. So then if that ever happens to you, I, I pray to God you don't get ambushed by that. But if you do, look at them and say, boy, there's nobody in this room who wants to be healed more than me. <laughs> but according to what Mark says, you're the one that doesn't have faith. I'm believing God for a miracle, but Mark 16 says it's a sign that accompanies those who believe. You've come in here as a believer. You've laid your hands on me. You've prayed for me to be healed, and I have not yet been healed. This is really a commentary on you. Why don't you have faith? Don't let them turn these things around on you. Take the passage. Embrace it. And he goes on and says, The Lord Jesus, after he'd spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. They went out, preached everywhere. They did exactly what he told them. Go and preach to all creation. While the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs, which he did in the apostolic era. And we're going to talk about that when we get into 1 Corinthians 13 and, and take a look at what Paul is saying about the whole gift discussion. Okay? All right. That's it. Questions? Questions?